Your lecturer is Professor Gregory S. Aldretti. Dr. Aldretti is Professor of Humanistic Studies and History at the University of Wisconsin Green Bay. A prolific writer in history, archaeology, and philology, he has received numerous awards for his teaching and research, including two fellowships from the National Endowment for the Humanities. Professor Aldretti maintains an active schedule of lectures to the public and is a national lecturer for the Archaeological Institute of America. A clever Greek inventor who builds automated statues that seem to come to life and wave their arms. A Mayan warlord named Smoking Frog who leads the warriors of his city to domination over their neighbors. An Indian mystic who founds a religion so devoted to the concept of non-violence that its followers wear masks so that they don't accidentally inhale and kill an insect. A Polynesian sailor so skilled at navigation that he can sail his canoe hundreds of miles across open ocean, guided only by the stars and some palm fronds. And finally, a wine-loving Chinese poet who writes that, when I drink a jug full, the whole world and I become one. History is about people. And by the end of this course, these are just a few of the people that you will meet. My name is Greg Aldrete and I teach ancient history at the University of Wisconsin Green Bay. Over the next 48 lectures, together, we will be looking at the very earliest civilizations that arose all around the globe, and we're going to follow their progress up until about the 8th century AD or so. While this is roughly structured as a standard chronological history course, I'll be exploring much more than just the events of history, however and I'll try to weave together a narrative that brings together all aspects of culture, including things like art, literature, architecture, philosophy, and religion. Some of the really fun things about taking this kind of uh, broad geographic, temporal, and cultural perspective are the opportunities that this will present to us for comparing one civilization to another and for trying to draw out similarities and differences among all these varied cultures. It'll also uh, give us the opportunity to think about how various historical groups, when faced with analogous problems, had to come to very different decisions or find different solutions to those problems. Scattered all throughout this course will be a, a number of lectures in which I will pause in that grand kind of historical narrative in order to, to focus in and compare and contrast certain key texts, people, uh, works of art, or philosophies from, from all kinds of different civilizations. Uh, for example, uh, at one point we'll look at the similarities in actions between Chinese emperors on the one hand and their Roman counterparts on the other. Uh, in another lecture, I'll compare Homer's Iliad with some of the epic poems from Vedic India. Let me begin with what may be a somewhat controversial assertion. What historians traditionally like to refer to as civilization is almost entirely an urban phenomenon. In other words, the sort of things that we typically focus on in courses like this uh, law codes, writing systems, technological innovations, art, all of that. All of these things tend to develop just in cities. Civilization itself is nurtured in an urban environment. Cities also produce most of the famous individuals that we'll focus on, including almost every king, emperor, inventor, uh, philosopher, poet, uh, artist, and warrior that I'll mention in this course. So, when we examine the history of civilization, what we should really say is that we are studying urban history, because it's from these cities and from the people who live in cities that almost everything we look at emanates. <laughs> 
This focus on cities and what happens in them is perfectly understandable if we're just concerned with new ideas and with big events that change the course of history. But the problem with this approach is that it really does not represent the typical experience of the average inhabitant of the ancient world. This is because for every person who lived in a city, there were probably eight or nine who lived out the entirety of their lives on a small family farm. So we need to keep in mind that almost all of what the usual history course spends its time on is really the atypical experiences of the tiny minority of the population who lived in cities and who produced what we like to think of as civilization. Now, I fully admit I'm going to do the same thing in this course. And quite honestly, all the interesting stuff really does tend to happen in cities. And, and I think both you and I would very quickly get bored uh, if I were to spend uh, 48 lectures talking about ancient farming techniques and life on a small family farm. But I just want to point out right here at the beginning that by choosing to focus on the cultures and the events that we do, we create an unrepresentative portrait of life in the ancient world. And we should never forget what the reality of daily existence was for that 80 to 90 percent of the people of the ancient world who were just farmers. So before we uh, abandon them in order to concentrate on all the fun stuff happening in the cities, it's worth posing the question, what was life like for that overwhelming majority of human beings who did not live in a city? Well, here, here's kind of what your life would have looked like. You were born on a small family farm. There was a pretty good chance that you would die in childhood of a disease. But if you were really lucky and you managed to survive to adolescence, then you would spend a couple decades scratching out uh, just enough food from the soil to, to maybe avoid starvation. Then you die. You would never travel more than 20 miles from the village where you were born. You would never see a king. You would never take part in a battle. You would never read a book. You'd probably be illiterate. Uh, you would probably never get to look at a single work of art. You would never get to hear any of these famous philosophers speak. And you probably would never even set foot in anything that we could call a city. In addition to that, you would never witness or even participate in any famous event that makes it into the history books. You would never get to experience any of the uh, cultural things that we like to study in courses like this and which we associate with civilization. You simply work in the mud of the family farm for a few years and that's it. Maybe occasionally somebody with a sword would show up and steal some of your crop. But quite honestly, whether that was done under the name of taxation or robbery uh, really doesn't matter to you. And this basic description applies equally well whether you lived in ancient Mesopotamia, uh, Egypt, India, or China. It's, it's equally accurate whether we can classify you as living in the Persian Empire or the Macedonian Empire, the Roman or the Han or the Mayan empires. Now, this life does sound pretty grim, and it is, but it was pretty much the universal experience of at least 80% of all human beings who have lived on the planet Earth prior to the Industrial Revolution. I always have the same sort of reaction when I hear someone who claims that uh, they've been reincarnated multiple times and that they remember all their past lives, because inevitably they'll say something like, well, in, in one life I was uh, an Egyptian pharaoh, and then in another I was a Roman gladiator, um, then I was a Persian princess, a, a Renaissance merchant, and finally a Spanish conquistador. And I always think to myself, well, you know, that, that's really remarkable, because according to the statistical odds, you should have been a farmer, a farmer, a farmer, a farmer, and a farmer. While I'm on the subject of statistics, uh, let me just add a couple more which represent uh, universal demographic trends 
for all of the ancient world and, and all of the cultures we're going to study pretty much. First of all, as I mentioned, mortality, and specifically infant mortality, was extremely high. Roughly between a quarter to a third of all babies died in their very first year of life, and childhood disease claimed many others. To put this another way, and this statistic may be of a particular resonance to the women who are listening to this lecture, every single woman in the ancient world who survived until the age of puberty then had to give birth successfully about five times, just, just to keep the population stable and to prevent it from dying out. Now, if you were lucky enough to make it, eh, let's say, into your 20s, you'd probably live a couple more decades. But very, very few people attained old age. For example, in the Roman Empire, it's estimated that only 5% of men lived past the age of 50. Throughout this course, we will often encounter institutions and behaviors that, that will seem very similar uh, to today. We'll say, oh, this is just like something that I recognize in my society. But these statistics, these, these cruel demographics of life and death, and especially that prevalence of childhood death from disease, really, I think, create a, a profoundly different world. And it's these sort of statistics, by the way, that are one of the very first things I mention whenever someone comes up to me and says, oh, I really wish I had lived in some earlier age. All right, next, I, I want to talk a little bit about these sources, which tell us about the ancient world. And to me as a historian, it's the very scarcity of surviving sources that makes the study of ancient history both sometimes a very exhilarating kind of thing to do, and sometimes a very frustrating one. And in this initial lecture, I want to offer two stories that I think illustrate both the, the range of evidence that historians and archaeologists use in interpreting the ancient world, as well as some of the problems and the challenges that those types of sources pose. Our first story, uh, begins in the mid-19th century. And this was a time when European scholars and, and really just adventurers uh, were going out, exploring the globe, and, and really trying to visit parts that, that no one had been to, at least no one from Western Europe had been to prior to them. So they were going to these kind of mysterious and little-known places to them. And one of these explorer scholars was a German named Heinrich Barth. Uh, he had studied in Berlin, and then he'd gone on and done further studies in London where he actually learned Arabic, which would have been very unusual for the time. And so, pretty well prepared, he then spends a number of years traveling across Africa. And he traversed the African continent several times. Uh, he went across the Sahara Desert, he went as far as Timbuktu and Cameroon, and finally, when he made it back to England, he wrote, as people tended to do then, this enormous account of his travels. It's five volumes, uh, 3,500 pages long. One of the areas that he went to was the desert of Tripolitania. Uh, today, this is part of Libya. And in his book, he describes an amazing archaeological site which he found in the desert there. He describes a series of huge, 10-foot-high stone pillars standing upright. And each of these pillars always was found in a pair, so there were always two of them together. Each pair of pillars had a third stone slab that was laid across their tops. And then in front of each one of these uh, structures was a big square stone block which was inscribed with groove channels. Barth labeled those square blocks altar stones. And he called the upright pillars sanams. Uh, this is after an Arabic word that means an idol. Now, think about that description of pairs of upright pillars, another on top. And does that remind you of anything? Well, in his book, Barth is reminded of something. And he comes to the natural conclusion that the whole structure bears a striking resemblance to the celebrated Celtic ruins at Stonehenge. Anyone 
who looks at them without prejudice or preconceived opinion will be impressed with the belief that they belong to a place of worship. The religious character of the whole structure can scarcely be doubtful from the nature of the flat stone, the channel in which was certainly intended to carry off the blood of victims. Barth's remarks describing this apparent North African Stonehenge then inspire another man, an Englishman named Cowper, to travel to Tripolitania and undertake a much more detailed study of them. Cowper ends up finding multiple sites all over North Africa, and all of them feature the same set of two upright pillars and a cross slab with an altar stone. The most spectacular of these is a place called Sanam Samana, and there he found no fewer than 17 of these imposing uh, trilithons lined up in a perfect row. Upon his return to England, Cowper publishes a book also enthusiastically describing his finds, and he identifies the ruins as megalithic temples of the same era as Stonehenge. He even goes further though. He recreates some of the rituals that he thinks must have been performed at these altars, and he connects them to ancient Babylonian gods and practices, and he even suggests that the builders of Stonehenge may once have emigrated from North Africa. This book, with its apparently amazing link between Stone Age Britain and Africa, brings him fame and success. There's just one problem with all this. Other scholars, apparently somewhat better acquainted with Mediterranean culture, soon prove, without any doubt whatsoever, that these structures which Barth and Cowper had excitedly identified as megalithic temples were actually from a much more uh, everyday sort of building. They were, in fact, the remains of Roman olive oil factories. Those upright pillars, they weren't part of a temple. Instead, they supported a big beam of wood originally, which was used to press olives. And those altar stones with their groove channels were not for blood sacrifice, but that's where you collected the freshly squeezed olive oil. Uh, I'll leave it to you to imagine Cowper's complete humiliation. Well, how could Cowper and Barth have been so utterly and embarrassingly wrong? They were, after all, some of the absolutely best educated, um, most scientifically trained people of their time. Barth, by the way, had even studied under the very famous naturalist Alexander von Humboldt in Berlin. So these guys represent the cutting edge of Victorian era scholarship. Well, the answer here, I think, reveals one of the dangers that scholars always face when it comes to interpreting a civilization other than your own. Cowper and Barth allowed their cultural biases to cloud their judgment. Coming from a European and specifically a British background, they were predisposed to interpret any archaeological evidence that they found through the lens of their own cultural knowledge. So, when they saw pairs of upright stone pillars, they immediately thought of Stonehenge and of temples. I, I, I suppose if uh, an Italian peasant of the time were somehow transported to England, uh, he would be very, very impressed with the apparently magnificent olive presses at Stonehenge. This example also reveals a broader kind of cultural bias. And this is one that has to do with environment. The sort of olive press which was used by the Romans at Sanam Samana is, is a basic design that's been continually used by Mediterranean farmers literally for thousands of years. Um, even today, uh, some poor farmers around the Mediterranean still use an identical sort of press. It's called a lever press. So anybody who's grown up in a Mediterranean region where olives are grown uh, and processed 
would have been likely to correctly identify the ruins. But olives don't grow in England or Germany. So, simply due to the climate that they came from, these two men, for all their scientific knowledge and, and great erudition, didn't recognize an olive press when it was literally staring them in the face. They were simply from the wrong environment, and they failed to take this into account when interpreting the evidence. And throughout this course, environment is going to play a key role over and over again. Finally, this story has even one more lesson for us. It very nicely, I think, uh, demonstrates some of the dangers inherent in making conclusions based solely on physical archaeological evidence. In this instance, they have ample archaeological ruins. They have tons of stone blocks, multiple sites. But there is no literary evidence to help them interpret that physical evidence. And any time you get that sort of situation, there is enormous potential for misinterpretation. And again, in future lectures, we will see over and over again how difficult it is to draw any sort of firm conclusion from physical evidence when you don't have textual sources. The North African Stonehenge of Sanam Samana is a nice cautionary tale. And it's really a story about the problems that can arise because of our own errors or prejudices when it comes to dealing with evidence from the ancient world. The second example I want to talk about here, though, addresses what really in some ways is a more disturbing question. And that is, how can we today draw reliable conclusions about the ancient world when the ancient evidence itself is biased? or even worse, is deliberately attempting to deceive us. One of the biggest problems when using any historical source, any textual source, is the fact that surviving documents will give just one side or one perspective of an event. Most ancient authors intentionally wrote in order to persuade an audience of the truthfulness of their viewpoint. And so their words represent a deliberately one-sided and biased version. Now, this might not be such a problem if we were able to simply compare multiple accounts against one another. But often, particularly for ancient history, we only have one surviving version. So how can we read such a obviously biased and selective text and come up with anything that we think uh, approximates what really happened. Well, sometimes, even with these sort of texts, it's possible to glean more information than the author maybe even intended to give us. As an example, let's consider uh, a text that will come up several times in this course. And this is a thing called the Behistun Inscription. It was written by King Darius I of Persia, and it's a message that he had inscribed on the side of a mountain. It's literally 200 feet up on the side of a mountain in the Zagros Mountains. And he has this inscription carved in three different languages, um, Persian, Elamite, and Babylonian. And on top of it is a nice rock carving of Darius the king trampling on his enemies while the god Ahura Mazda floats kind of approvingly overhead. So given this spectacular setting and the enormous amount of work that went into making this triple inscription, this is obviously a message that was very important to Darius and that he really, really wanted to be preserved. Well, as it turns out, the Behist inscription is just about as obvious a work of propaganda as you can possibly find. And the opening lines of this inscription, I think, give you a, a good sense of the flavor and really the lack of subtlety of his message. I am Darius, the great king, the king of kings, the king of Persia, the king of all countries, the son of a king, 
the grandson of a king. Says Darius, the king, from long ago, my family has been kings. Darius goes on to list no fewer than 23 separate countries that he has conquered and that he now rules over. In addition to describing those conquests, he lists a number of instances in which some of his subjects rebelled but were crushed by his armies. And he even describes in, in somewhat uh, excessive detail the gruesome punishments that the rebels suffered. All of this comes off as a straightforward assertion of his power and his total domination over his empire, which no doubt is exactly the message Darius wanted to send. But even within such a seemingly simplistic piece of boasting and propaganda, it's possible to draw forth a more complex understanding of the situation in the Persian Empire, and even, even to find evidence that seems to undercut some of his assertions of power. For example, he describes one rebellion that breaks out in Armenia, and in his own words, Darius says, I said to my general, go, the rebellious army, which does not call itself mine, smite it. And by the grace of Ahura Mazda, my army smote that rebellious army utterly. Uh, one would assume that this would be the end of the matter. Um, after all, that sort of wonderfully rich phrasing in the inscription, if you smite something utterly, then surely it's, it's been completely obliterated, wiped off the face of the earth. But if we go on to the very next section of the inscription, we find the line, quote, says Darius the king, a second time the rebels came together. Well, here we have a problem. If the rebels had really been smitten utterly that first time, there shouldn't be any of them left to rise up a second time. In other words, in his own piece of propaganda, we have caught Darius in a lie. Furthermore, in a statement which he intends to convince an audience of his power, we've actually found evidence of the weakness of his control over his empire. So this is a really nice example of how one can sometimes learn more from a text than the author intended, and occasionally even to learn things he was trying to conceal. Just to finish up this story, by the way, Darius then sends his army back to Armenia a second time, and as he describes it, At the fortress of Tigra, they engaged in battle, and by the grace of Ahura Mazda, my army smote that rebellious army utterly. Okay, sounds good. But if we read on to the very next section, the next section begins, says Darius the king, a third third time the rebels came together. Well, as by now I'm sure you can guess, Darius then claims to have smitten them utterly a third time, and, and maybe this time it was for real, since for the rest of the inscription we hear no more about rebels in Armenia. Nevertheless, by this point a careful reader will have come away from this text with a very, very different impression than the one that Darius intended. These two examples of ancient sources, one of physical archaeological evidence and the other of a written text, reveal some of the problems that we face with interpretation, both ancient and modern, that really we encounter any time we try to study the ancient world. As an ancient historian, one of the things that bothers me is when people make overly confident claims about ancient history and, and fail to really admit how much of our knowledge that we like to claim we have is really more speculation than firm fact. Over the course of these lectures, I am going to try to be honest with you. I will admit moments when our understanding or our interpretation of something rests on shaky evidence. And I'll try to point out to you instances where scholars themselves debate over what happened, or where events are controversial, and there is no definite opinion about what the reality was. 
This course is going to cover an enormous span, both geographically and chronologically. But just to conclude this introduction, let me draw your attention to a couple of, I think, broad themes that will link together many of the various cultures that we'll study. First of all, as we proceed through history, always take note of how the physical environment in which a culture develops affects how that culture evolves. In the very next lecture uh, on the ancient Near East, we'll see a, a wonderful example of a specific environment having very dramatic effects on almost every aspect of a culture, from its religion to its architecture. Secondly, keep an eye out for instances when two civilizations collide or intermingle. Uh, sometimes this happens peacefully due to migration, sometimes it can be due to invasion. But often, key moments of change or transformation are sparked by these sorts of interactions. Uh, for example, uh, when the Western Roman Empire and various barbarian nations will combine to create what we think of as medieval Europe. Third, watch for uh, innovations or experiences that seem to be parallel or really even universal across all civilizations. For instance, uh, early on almost all cultures develop some sort of system of writing. But why they do this, uh, what they write on, and what they use that system for varies uh, very widely. Finally, a lot of our contemporary culture today has its origins directly in antiquity. So that by the end of our trip through ancient history and really all around the globe, you should have a better sense of how the world that you live in today was formed. This will be a journey full of uh, important discoveries, colorful personalities, and memorable stories. And I hope you'll enjoy it. Thank you.